Yeah, okay, so let's talk now about how collaboration between design and scientific research can help make uh, visible the data and the science that shows how our climate is changing. Of course, we can increasingly feel with our bodies and see with our eyes the impact of temperature rises, but information design has done so much to tackle complex data and clearly show patterns that can sound the alarm and prompt decisions and action. So Asha Mins is the director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Research here at the University of East Anglia. And I'm going to do a reading now from his CV, um, working with people who, would, uh, who need to be thinking about climate change and carbon dioxide emissions for quite some decades. Not your typical academic CV and straight to the point. Thank you, Asha. Stephanie uh, Posavec is a designer, artist, and author focused on creating playful, accessible, human-scaled approaches to communicating with data. Her work has been exhibited at major galleries, including the V&A, the Design Museum, Somerset House, and Welcome Collection, where her work has also been in permanent collection at the uh, MoMA in New York. Recently, she undertook the book design and art creation, uh, art direction of the chart creation for the activist Greta Thunberg's much lauded The Climate Book. So Asha, Steph, in conversation, over to you. Hello, everyone can hear me, testing. Hi there, it's hot in this suit, I'm just getting some water. Right. Shall I start? Yes. Oh. Yeah. In conversation. <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure, of course, to meet um, Stephanie. And thank you to the Design Council for making that happen. And also, it's, of course, a delight to be here. But the overall topic is collaboration, which is what we're all about. So the Tyndall Centre, I've got a squeaky chair. The Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research was established in 2000 here at the University of East Anglia. And we are a partnership of different academic disciplines, engineers, city engineers, economists, social scientists, physical scientists, atmospheric scientists, all working together on what to do about climate change. So that's what the Tyndall Centre does. We've been doing it for 23 years. And none of those people spoke the same language when they started. So that was a lot of work was doing that, getting an economist to understand what um, uh, an atmospheric scientist was talking about. But before that, here at the University of East Anglia, which is obviously where you are, the, it was set up in the, in the 1960s, a 1960s university, and the School for Environmental Sciences was all about collaboration until the School of Environmental Sciences here at the University of East Anglia, environmental science wasn't a thing. So this was looking at what's going on, what's going on in the environment, what's, what's happening to the planet, and then bringing together, again, different scientific disciplines to all work together on the School of Environmental Sciences, which is um, uh, just down around the corner. And as part of the environmental sciences is the Climatic Research Unit. And they are the people who probably, well, did start putting together the data of what is happening with climate change, collecting that data. We're going to be talking about data. And from the Climatic Research Unit came my organisation, the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. Something's going on here. We've been looking at the data what are we going to do about it? So the Tyndall Centre is very much about responding to climate change. It's happening. What are we going to do about it? We haven't quite got the solution yet, but we are getting warmer. Dad joke. <laughs> Steph. Um, <laughs> that was a very good, very good intro. Great joke. Um, I don't have any jokes in mind, but I do have slides, so I will. Uh, I've got something vi visual. Just to give you a little intro to me and what I do. So I've had a very lovely introduction uh, beforehand, but yeah, I'm a designer, artist, and author who likes to work with data in very exper like experimental ways. So uh, you can see some examples of what my work looks like on screen. So it doesn't look like your, uh, I guess, traditional visualizations, but instead I'm exploring ways of making data more experiential or playful or interactive, whether it's, um, you know, creating um, 
you know, a, a residency in the National Maritime Museum or making data that you can dance through or um, work for the Welcome Collection um, or using data to uh, create designs for um, Royal Papworth Hospital's inpatients ward or even, um, actually I'll just say that I am, I wouldn't consider myself a climate data expert. I am a data person first and foremost and probably a climate lay person, definitely. So the closest I've come is uh, um, designing the interiors and chart directing uh, charts for Greta Thunberg's uh, climate book. Um, but some other things that I have done, I, I'm really into making uh, data accessible and interesting to lay audiences who might be intimidated or just they just don't like the idea of data. So I've done that through like a collaboration with the designer Georgia Lupi. Um, we had this project a while back called Dear Data where we collected our personal data every week for a year and then drew it on a postcard and sent it to the other. And so this is a personal project, but it resulted in a book, a journal, is in MoMA, but the best thing about it is that um, it's now used as a project as uh, for curriculums uh, for all ages um, to, to across the world to um, teach people how to collect and present data to kind of you know, welcome the data, the people who are afraid of data into understanding and kind of um, learning more about it. And then on that topic, um, I guess my mo most recent book is with my friend Miriam Quick, I'm a book, I'm a portal to the universe. So this is for ages eight and up. And the way that it works is uh, the book is a, um, showcases the wonders of the universe, uh, like data from our world on a one-to-one -one scale where the book is the measure. So the thickness of a page or an interaction, the turn of a page or the volume of the book communicates data. And so this, um, I'm really into this like way of communicating data to a more general audience. And uh, we're really pleased it won the Royal Society's Young People's Book Prize um, in 2021 where like, uh, I think 11,500 young people voted it the winner. So I think we really see the um, value of this approach when reaching a wider audience. Um, but that's just a bit about me and my practice. And I think we had three questions that we were gonna try to answer. Uh, and I'll, I'll hand uh, the slides over. And I think the first big one was um, what climate data, and this is for Asher, what climate data do you think is most important to to, to, to communicate, to, to get out into the, the world. Okay. Thanks, Steph. So we do data. So my colleagues, uh, they, they are data heads. They, 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 they live numbers and they are really what they are is mathematicians mostly who like to do really, 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 really hard sums. And that's kind of what climate change came, comes from in a way. The, the, the scientific understanding of climate change is mathematicians who like to do really hard sums because there isn't a harder sum than what on earth is going on in the atmosphere and, in, and its interaction uh, with the planet. So, well, what is going on with the atmosphere? So hopefully um, some people recognize these as the climate stripes. Hands up if people know the climate stripes. Pretty good, that's very good. So they come out of uh, Reading University. Um, they were shown at the Rio Olympics. They were beamed on the wall. And um, please don't be scared, I'm not undressing. Um, I'm, I, I have them here. And these are the Norwich climate stripes because not, they've taken a life of their own, the climate stripes. And not only are they They're, um, they're on global, book covers as well, the, on are, the, yes. the, the, Greta, the Greta book cover. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah. So, so, but that was, um, yeah. Ed, a uh, 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 climate scientist from Reading, put these together, and they've taken a, a life of their own. So, so much so that sort of people are identifying them. There's um, some fen there's a fence in Norwich that's actually painted with the, with the climate stripes as well. So, it's some something's happened there. But the data, we're talking a little bit about data and making the uh, invisible visible and that's it. As it gets warmer, it gets redder. But what's the most important data point perhaps? I couldn't quite decide on one, the, the most essential data. Um, this is the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere and you can see the graph, it's, it's, it's over time and a really um, quite significant a rise in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and tied to that is 
what we now call the climate stripes, or sometimes it's called the hockey stick, the, the direction of temperature as it goes up in response to the amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But it's not only, and this is where we have to do bigger thinking, bigger collaborative thinking, it's not only about the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, it's a budget. It's the global carbon budget. There, there is a, a budget for the amount of uh, fossil fuels and carbon dioxide that should go into the atmosphere. There's, an, a, there's a budget for how much should be coming down as well. And so that is the whole Earth system. You'll know I sort of stayed away from trying to do anything very good graphics here, because um, that's Steph's job. Um, so, so yeah, we've got too much fossil fuels going up, we've got too much deforestation going on, which it means that the carbon dioxide isn't being sucked down into the, into the, uh, into the trees. Uh, similarly, with soils, there's a lot of land being changed for agriculture. The, um, the soils are being disturbed, they're not sucking up or storing as much carbon. The ocean has a role in here as well, as a, a simile as a carbon sink. And so it's all about this circular economy of the exchange of gases into the atmosphere, down to the planet, into the atmosphere, and down, down to the planet. And so we do get fixated on carbon dioxide and fossil fuels. There's a bit more to the story, which is the entire uh, planetary system um, living in the Anthropocene and what's happening there. And this is the global carbon budget. And this similarly is a collaboration. That one point, that projection for 2022 is produced for the UN climate summits every year. Um, the next one will be in December, so just before Christmas. And that data itself is a huge collaboration that creates all of the data from across every country on the planet, the, um, from their, their use of, of fuel, it takes all that and eventually makes one point on the graph. To get that data analysed in time for the UN climate summits, called COPS, there was one in Glasgow in 2021, people might remember, that data has to, is past northern and southern hemisphere 24 hours a day. They, one shift gets up, one shift goes to bed, one shift gets up, one shift goes, goes to bed. So yeah, it's a collaboration in itself, a, a north-south collaboration to get that data, that one data point. And that maybe is, if you work in climate change, the most important data point in the world. It's what's happened to emissions in the last year and mostly they go up. I'm not going to explain the shape. I think you can probably um, guess why there's a dip around about 2020, what happened that meant that a lot of fossil fuels weren't being built, uh, being burnt even. Let's see if that's gonna go, we've got a bit stuck here. There we go, and that data has been uh, shown in very many ways, loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of ways um, that data gets used. Some of it is around this time is running out. So the idea that there's a stopwatch of the, of the carbon budget, how much carbon, uh, how much fossil fuels into carbon can be burned and where is the threshold? So the policy question is how much global warming and by when? And the Paris Agreement, the UN Paris Agreement of 2015, said between one and a half and two degrees. That will be the, the, the temperature target. No, no more than two degrees, ideally one and a half degrees. We're kind of at about 1.1, 1.2. Right now, we're probably about one and a half degrees. Um, temporarily, this is yet another globally uh, re record hot year uh, globally, so that one and a half degrees threshold will be passed in the, not exactly the next few years, but soonish. So, so that bottom threshold has gone, and so it's not only how much carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere, it's by when for those carbon targets. Uh, I'm going to stop there, I think, actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think we're all, so we had three questions that we were in, we thought we would have conversations about, and the next one was looking at um, 
you know, us thinking about how can we make data visualization more impactful or, I guess, more meaningful and kind of, you know, make people more engaged in, I guess, the message and the insights of the data that you're trying to present. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, I guess, the background? Yeah, sure. So, that, well, the next bit was um, not, you know, so that was the data. You know, we do data, lots and lots and lots of data. <laughs> Um, which uh, yeah, Steph, Steph makes real and says so going to talk about the data. My, one of my roles, or mostly it's been engaging people with climate change who don't know that they should be thinking about climate change. Um, often that, that's policy makers, um, but I, th I thank you for, uh, for being here also. Um, and we have to think very much about, so it's going to be funny, um, very much about how people engage with data, so it's not only the presentation of the data, it's almost the social science. I use a lot of social science, I use a lot of marketing. And this is um, from a guy called Sh uh, um, Shalom Schwartz, who did a universal map of values and how people engage with climate change, environment, and actually everything in their life is all about their values. We, we do that all the time. We can't help it. We're looking at the values for whether we engage with a piece of inf information or not. And this can be used. This is a real map of values. This so far holds true in 91 countries. So it's universal values. People have these values in 91 countries that people uh, respond to and you can use this as a way of engaging people. So universalism up there in the top, uh, your top, top left corner, uh, right corner is, um, is green because that is those universal values around environmental protection, equality, social justice, some of the common values. The real distance from that is power and achievement. So that's a real map, that's real dis distance. Those are opposites but we all rotate around these um, values at different times in our day, in our life, in our, in our journey. So understanding people's values is a lot of how to engage people with things that they don't really want to be thinking about. Maybe you don't talk about climate change. You talk about something else and then eventually you end up with climate. And if I can do that, um, and if we're, we're all in the UK here, so you can look at that even further. You can look to see who, what are the, um, the seven segments is worked by, um, comes from a, a, an organization called More in Common that looks to see what are the shared values of people. Um, and it segments them into these different, uh, different, different audience, different segments. So again, thinking about who it is that we're engaging with, probably quite a lot of us here possibly share quite a lot of those universal values. That's why we're here um, in a Design for Planet conference. Um, other people might be um, coming from different backgrounds and, and not share those, share those same values, but we can, we can look at values to engage those people. And I'm going to go to oh, you. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So um, thinking about um, yeah, like how how to engage people in regards to I guess yeah, communicating data and you know thinking about the topic of making the invisible visible. Um, I'll just share a couple uh, quick slides of uh, the space that I work in, which is I'm I'm really interested in creating. Uh, like visualizing data in ways that are experiential and where the data is embodied and able to be interacted with, where you have sort of like human engagement um, like with that data. Um, I, I find it really interesting, you know, well, like this idea of directly rooting data into that, into a person's world, you know, a kind of like, what you, you know, finding a way in that relates to that, that person and connecting, connecting with them in that capacity. So I'll just share, um, a space I've been working in uh, with my collaborator, Miriam Quick, um, for a, the next few, sli few slides, uh, a data journalist, um, where we started, this is uh, a project that's quite old, but it still has legs. It's currently on display at Bletchley Park, Air Transformed, where it was a little test, 
visualizing air pollution data from Sheffield, um, and the brief was to try to come up with ways of communicating air quality data to a citizen audience who might not really care about air quality data. So we created these data objects where they, we had these necklaces showing weeks of large particle pollution data in Sheffield as something you could touch and wear. So this is the week of bonfire night for that year where that shard represents that pollution um, that was in the air um, on bonfire night. And then also exploring with these glasses showing days of like particularly, you know, di you know, different days of pollution in Sheffield where you have the actual numbers but you, you, you wear these different glasses and depending on the pollution for that day, it makes your vision more or less hazy depending on the data. So kind of creating this experiential way of uh, presenting the data. Um, and so that had then extended, you know, we created this book where thinking about climate and warming, um, uh, Miriam uh, calculated using the book as a measure, like you're holding this book, this book which like is what you use to have an idea of like a certain amount of Arctic ice, and then she's been able to calculate like how this, this amount of ice is how much is melting by the emission, um, based on the emissions of like a half an hour drive that you take. And this is the outcome of, um, on this spread. Um, or even in this book where we're trying to make data rooted in, the, in a person's world, you know, showing different sea level rises on a one-to-one -one scale where a child or young person can prop that book up in their space and then begin to think about like what that feels like in their space or their, their room and, and so on. And so then I, um, this isn't with Miriam, but I've, you know, extending this further into like data that you can walk into, like this is at the University of Plymouth, talking about what creatures are within 500 cubic meters of water at Plymouth breakwater, um, of sea around Plymouth breakwater, where you're actually walking into the, the data visualization and imagining what type of creatures would be swirling around you. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think that anything to make uh, data memorable and rooted in one's lived experience to understand it better is really important. Well, like a great way of, of doing it. So this one was just a, a case study. We were chatting uh, in, in preparation and um, this, this data is what, or this visualization, sorry, is what got my, um, my daughter's school to put up big no idling signs in their car park, in their playground, which is also the car park at drop off and, and, and pick up time. So I've been talking to the headmaster for ages about this. You can imagine I'm a bit annoying when it comes to um, uh, env environment things. And, uh, and, and, and this was the one that did it, that was it. And now there is no idling signs all around the, um, or the, the playground. And so while I yeah, quite righteously cycle in my cargo bike with my daughter on the back, see a car idling, I just point to the sign and they turn it off. So there's now no idling in my daughter's car park because of that visualization. Um, well, and uh, um, I'm happy that you shared it with me because now I have that on my mind whenever I see someone idling as well. Um, so, uh, you know, but if we, I guess, bring it back to climate graphics, I just um, wanted to share a, uh, from the latest IPCC report, a graphic that I found really compelling. Um, like I said, I, I, I feel like I'm probably a client. I feel like a climate layperson. I'm a, I'm a data professional, but um, definitely don't feel like a climate expert. And there are tons of incredible IPCC graphics that I guess are um, co-designed with the, the scientists who are authoring the report. And I think I read that they're also user tested or th with, with the Tyndall Center as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. We, um, again, collaborations. Um, uh, Jordan Harold, who's a, 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 a psychologist here at UEA, uh, University of East Anglia, he did his PhD about the psychology of IPC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Graphics. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does the big mother of all assessments of everything known about climate knowledge um, every, every few years. And uh, before that, it was scientists doing the data. I'll just leave that there. And, uh, and after that, they got, after being uh, introduced to the psychology of how people interact with data and experiments around how people interact with data and, and user testing, there's now lots of graphic designers involved doing, doing the data. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, that, so we've been quite involved in 
gently nudging the way that the data is presented there? Um, yeah, I, I definitely heard um, different, um, I guess, within the realm of data visualization, different um, information designers who have worked on previous reports and how it's this really intensive uh, co-design collaborative process. And so, like, you know, I, I think there are lots of uh, really incredible um, charts and visualizations, but this is the one that really struck me recently. And it's because, I mean, I know the climate stripes, they are elegant, they, they communicate like information so concisely, but for me, the thing that I found, found most compelling as like a lay person seeing this chart, I think it's the first, or at least the first that I've seen in my very quick research, that they put people down at the bottom of it. And this is what really struck me more than just seeing the abstract lines is, you know, I have a daughter who's six. So thinking of seeing when she's 70 years old, potentially how warm it could be. Um, uh, I don't know, it just impacted me so much more than seeing some of the more abstracted uh, visualizations. Um, and I think you were also saying that this is like this idea of people and, and like age, it, it, like how old people will be when certain things happen is what you will often use. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as it happens, not as um, as groovy as, th as this graphic, but I've been putting, um, for if I do sort of public presentations, um, people along the bottom of the timeline for, for ex ex exactly um, uh, for, for, for exactly that that reason to to put some some significance to it because as somebody was saying earlier, you know, it's actually it's not really about us here and now. It's kind of uh, of clearly about the, the the future generations, and it's very difficult to imagine that without that. Um, significance of, of, of timelines. I've been doing this so long that 2023 probably seemed like a long time away when we started out. You know, all those are climate targets into the future. Well, we're here and we're here now. So it's it's what comes next. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I have one more slide, which I feel like I'm just going to show things I think are really exciting to me, and it's really embarrassing, but I'm just going to show it anyway. <laughs> um, so this book, because um, we won the uh, Young Pe Royal Society's Young People's Book Prize, so when we were in the running, I researched the winner of the year before, and it was this book for children and young people, so 8 to 14, so 11, I don't know, thousands of children voted this the winner of the shortlist. And I just find it really wonderful and compelling, so it takes science, data, information, and it communicates it in the most absurd, like, bonkers way, which is through these wild photos of cats. It just seemed like such, like I wish I had come up with the idea. It seemed like a wonderful, absurd, like joyful way of communicating science information. And I, you know, we have one of these library books in my house. My daughter is obsessed with cats. She read it cover to cover and I don't think she would have done it otherwise. I mean, she's quite young. And so I just think that there is space for playfulness and absurdity and, um, you know, like humor uh, within the whole communication process as well. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think the, what we were going to finish out on was science and design collaborations. Yes, I think we might be coming, coming, com coming, ahead, yeah. coming up to time. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So I mean, this is a value, isn't it? So on the Shalom Schwartz big map, just put cats, and people will people will access information about climate change. I was going to say on the last one actually about the humans um, uh, along the bottom. Um, activists now, quite a lot of activists, more probably than you would realise, um, now have the um, the uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide tattooed on them somewhere. They use that rather than the birth date in the knowledge that, that those dates, that they, that amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will never be repeated again. So it's 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 as unique as their as their birth date, which the first time I saw that, actually on some artists, um, I thought that's quite extreme. Um, but you know, this this you know humans and data and and, 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 and people. Um, I think I was just going to, the next one actually wasn't wasn't really, um, I wasn't going to play it as a, vid a video, and I think we um, could better use the time with questions and discussion. Um, but uh, just lots of collaborations with artists. So um, since I joined the Tyndall Centre, I've been working with artists for a long time, and this is a, um, a sort of retrospective of, of some of those. Some of them have gone on to win um, 
all sorts of prizes and things because they've been early career artists when I've been working with them. Um, when I say well, I'm working with them, they're just facilitating and supporting them. It's completely their own, their own work. It's what it is they, they want to do, accessing information. Um, and at the back there, I'll, I think on the table, so this is, um, there's another university in Norwich. It's got the uh, most highly educated small city population ever, University of East Anglia and um, Norwich University of the Art. So this is... Um, uh, work that some fine artists worked on. So you can pick these up at the back. And these are, they basically took pieces of research, papers and from the Tyndall Centre and produced their own, their own artwork. So do pick that up as, a, as another type of collaboration. Um, kind of lost track of where these people are now, but um, there, there are lots of examples of collaboration between creativity and data and, and, and the research that we do as well. So have those. Okay, we probably only have time for one question from the room. Does anyone want to ask a question? Go on. Uh, I can't get a mic to you. Can you shout, uh, Vanessa, and then I will... Shall I share my mic? Well, if you repeat the question, because online audience would want... So for the online audience, that question is about how to bring together art and design in education. And science. And science. Um, oh, that's a big one. Um, I, uh, I mean, I don't feel like I know enough about, um, I mean, I sound American. I don't really know how the <laughs> university <laughs> university system is a little bit different here for me. Um, but I feel like, um, I guess there's a couple things as a designer who got into data. Um, I, well, I think there's a few things, and I don't really know if this will answer the question. Firstly, I don't think people tell you that scientists and artists live their lives in very similar ways. They have big ideas that they're trying to solve problems for, and then they need to acquire a lot of funding to make that happen. But it feels like, like they are parallel ways of living and trying to create and come up with solutions. And I don't think I realized that until after I, I graduated. So I think just realizing that there's a parallel there, that there is this creativity across probably would be useful to me as a, as a young person. Of course, I'm sure lots has moved on since then. Um, but then I think also, and I, you know, I think that more and more data is touched upon definitely in like universities today, but I think that many creatives still uh, are afraid of data or intimidated by it. They don't feel like they're stats people or they're afraid of getting it wrong and, you know, being, you know, it's quite intimidating and it's quite a responsibility. So I think like kind of just showing people that it can be very, you know, most people are friendly and welcoming <laughs> and it's not intimidating is probably an important thing as well. There's a big history to that um, from C.P. Snow, who basically d who um, talks about the, uh, the, 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 the just, just the different types of discipline that people get streamed into whatever their specialism in. Oh, you're a scientist. Oh, you're an engineer. Oh, you're, you're going to be an artist. Um, and, and he wrote a book about it called The Two Cultures in 1950-something. Um, and so ever since then, there's been different cultures in education. And so some universities and sort of forward-thinking ones are getting better at putting all that together rather than being in the biology department or the environmental sciences or the creative writing or something. You, you mix it all together, and that is work that's been going on here at the University of East Anglia as well. But it's not only about education making that happen, whether it's in schools or universities. Not everybody goes to university. It's... Um, I think the youngsters want it themselves, actually. So I've been very struck by how they ask about um, some of these questions, but from their own standpoint, so not from a sort of disciplinary perspective, they're just interested. And then one of, for any of us who employ people, 
it's one of the first questions gets asked now, I think, pretty pretty early on when you ask, you know, at the end of an interview, when you when it's that, oh, have you got any questions you would like to ask? And quite a lot of them are asking, how green are you? you know, and so they don't want to work for dirty companies anymore. They want to know that it actually has the values that appeals to them. So I think it's one of those changes that's going to happen anyway. Great. Uh, thank you very much. As I took the train to Design for Planet and I was scrolling on my phone, I thought I'm not going to do any cat memes for a couple of days, but it turns out that uh, I was wrong. Um, thank you so much uh, to Asher and Steph for that fantastic. <laughs>